Jia. Thank you all for welcoming me here today. Uh, that was such a, a great introduction, men mentioning Steve Krug's book, Don't Make Me Think. That's a, an awesome read, a great uh, introductory book into user experience design, which is a lot of what I'm going to be discussing here today. Uh, I love that we also mentioned attracting, converting, and uh, retaining our, our customers, because these are things that are so essential to what we do uh, at HubSpot, both in e-commerce and also just in inbound marketing and design in general. Our entire methodology is built around this sort of bet that we're making, that if we can attract people to a, a well-designed site that's going to work well and give them the information that they need, and then convert them into customers, and then delight them after they've become customers, recognizing that we're still building a relationship with the people that are going to be uh, working with our brand, that we're always going to have a better experience for them, and they're going to be more likely to bring additional uh, customers into our company and, and into the work that we're doing. So I really like that approach. Uh, and I think that you'll see that sort of uh, come out through the talk that I'm going to give here today. So uh, are we good to go? Yes. All right. So this is what I'm going to talk about, UX design to increase conversion the HubSpot way. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we approach design and marketing and conversion at HubSpot. By show of hands, how many of you all have heard of HubSpot before? All right, pretty good. So just in case you haven't heard of HubSpot, we are a software as a service company based out of Boston, Massachusetts. And we produce marketing and sales software that companies can use to run all of their marketing in one place and all of their sales in one place and then integrate that information. So these are some pretty powerful softwares that we're building. And we have to have a really good website in order to tell people about these softwares and to get them into the software itself. So that's what I focus on. Uh, as a senior UX designer at HubSpot, I oversee the UX for HubSpot.com and all of its primary web properties. These are some pretty big websites. They receive around 8 million hits per month. So we're dealing with a lot of different users from all over the world. And we run into some interesting challenges, especially when it comes to conversion. We always want to be on the cutting edge of that stuff. So that's what I'm going to discuss today. We really believe that the best conversion opportunities exist at the convergence of three things. And those are design, sales, and marketing. When you can bring really good design really good sales, and really good marketing together all at once, you're going to have a really good opportunity to convert people and delight them and bring them into your brand. And we actually view each one of these as tools to accomplish the goals that we have set for our business. And we do that in very specific ways. In fact, we have very specific approaches to design marketing and sales that we like to refer to as user experience design, so that's what I focus on. Inbound marketing. How many of you all, show of hands, have heard of inbound marketing before? OK. So inbound marketing is uh, a very interesting approach to online marketing that uh, HubSpot has actually pioneered. And then for sales, we also uh, approach sales through the, an, an inbound sales process. So it, it follows a similar path. I'm not going to be able to talk about inbound marketing or inbound sales today. But if you want to learn about them uh, separately, you can follow either of these short links, uh, these URLs on your computer. And they will take you to a page where you can learn all about how we think about marketing and how we think about sales. But today, I'm going to talk about UX design specifically. Now, there are a couple things that, uh, on a basic level, you need to know about all three uh, of these things, the things that they hold in common. So they are all human-centered, which means that we believe that you should always put the user, the customer, the individual at the center of your design decisions, at the center of your marketing decisions, and at the center of your sales decisions. So we're always working with our customers. We're always working with our users in order to understand what decisions we should be making. This is a refreshing approach because it gets us out of the boardroom. It gets us out of our internal meetings, out of our companies, and lets us talk to the actual people that are using our products to drive our decisions. 
they, these are also cross-informed with each other, which means that when we learn something through a design experiment that we run, we can take that information and apply it to our marketing and to our sales. When we learn something through marketing testing, we can apply that to sales and design. We want to have very, very closely integrated relationships between the people that are doing design, marketing, and sales at our company. And ultimately, our goal is to provide a great experience, have people uh, enjoy themselves when, when they're on our site, when they're dealing with our marketing and th going through our sales process. But there's a little bit of, pr of a problem when we try to do this. Despite the fact that we really love to focus on experiences holistically and we love to talk about experience design, this is generally the type of stuff that we focus on. Social media posts, search results, paid ads, this is what we're thinking about the most, and essentially, this is just basic marketing, or sort of the pre-site experience. So what happens before somebody even comes to our website? But if we really look at the interaction that people have with our brands holistically today, it actually looks something more like this. Sure, they're going to interact with our ads and our social media posts, but they're also going to be landing on our site and dealing with maybe a landing page, navigation, a blog structure. And they're also going to have a post-site experience where they may talk to sales representatives or support individuals, or maybe they're even receiving emails from us. This, collectively, is what makes up the experience that somebody has with our brand. And this, all together, is what we focus on in user experience design. On a more intimate level, we even run into this issue. Uh, oh, another thing to note about these is that they cross-inform each other. So what this means is that if we find something out through our ads, we can apply that back to our website. If we find something out on our website, we can apply that back to the sales process, basically making sure that people have a consistent experience throughout the entire time that they're interacting with us. But we also run into this issue on, on a, a closer level with our website designs. When we think about what we want to create within our websites, we, we tend to think about it in pieces. Like, I'm going to create a single blog post. So this is really nice. It's, it's a good blog post about 31 marketing tools for startups. We have some good con written content in there. We have a good call to action in the middle of it. But this isn't the only thing that people interact with when they go to our website. Actually, they're going to be looking at something more like this, where we have a navigation at the top with a call to action. We have a little section off to the right where people can join our email list. There's a lot more to the website than just these little pieces that we focus on so much. And really, again, this is what encompasses the entire experience that people have with us. And again, these elements can cross and form each other. So we can learn something from the core content on our site and apply it back to these other elements off to the side and vice versa. But things can go even deeper than this. Maybe we have a little call to action that slides down from the top and says, hey, you should sign up for this offer today. And maybe we have a slide in that pops out from the right and says, seriously, sign up for our exclusive offer. And then if somebody tries to leave our website, we're going to hit them with a modal that says, wait, don't leave. We'll, we'll give you everything for free. Just please don't leave. Now, each one of these elements in isolation of the other elements may make sense to us. We may hear somebody say, oh, if you add an exit pop-up to your website, it's going to increase conversion by this much. If you add a slide into your website. It will increase conversion by this much. And we just keep adding all of these things in isolation of each other. But then when we look at the entire experience that people have on our website, it's pretty crappy. This is not the type of experience that we want to be creating for our users. We need to be thinking more holistically. And so in an industry where we would classically say that content is king, what we find ourselves actually realizing when we introduce design to the equation is that context is king. The context that we design our elements in, the context that we write in, is what we should be paying attention to the most. So this is where we can really see the strength 
of UX specifically come into play. And that's what I want to uh, discuss in more depth here today. So I'm going to do this through four different sections. At first, I'm going to talk about the fundamentals of user experience design. So what is UX? What's the process look like? How do we actually do this? Then I'm going to share some statistics with you. Why should we care about user experience design? What's the data behind this? What's happening? Then I'm going to go into an example of an actual project that we did at HubSpot. And then finally, I want to share some tools with you all that you can take back to your workplace after today and use in order to do user experience design every day. So we'll start with the fundamentals of UX. This is my personal definition of user experience design. And it's really long, but the most important sentence in this entire definition can kind of sum it up for us, and it is this. It is that user experience is human-centered, data-inspired design that assists both the, both the users and the goals, the business, sorry, in achieving their goals. So there's four important words here, the first of which is human-centered. So again, we're putting the user at the center of our decisions. The second is data-inspired. You've probably heard the word data-driven or some derivative of that a lot. But this is a little problematic because it indicates that we're only making decisions based off of data. We used to do that at HubSpot, and it didn't work out too well for us because we found out that, yes, data can take a good design and make it great, but data cannot take a bad design and make it good. So you have to have something somewhere in between where you're talking to users, you're letting your designers experiment, but you're also using data to justify your decisions and drive that uh, larger direction. We will assist the users in achieving their goals. This is something that is very commonly associated with user experience design. But less commonly known is that we're also equally helping the business achieve their goals. So the best design solutions are going to take a problem for the business and solve for the users and for the business. There are six principles that govern user experience design. The first is that the design should be based on an explicit understanding of users, their tasks, and their environment. Users should be involved throughout the entire design and development process. The design should be driven and refined by user-centered evaluation. The process should be iterative, so we're constantly working on these designs. It never stops. We're always improving it. We're always finding better ways to design. The design should address the entire user experience. So this is sort of what I was talking about earlier. Instead of focusing on single, isolated pieces, we're going to think about how our changes affect the entire website. And the design team should include multidisciplinary skills and perspectives. So you want to have designers that come from different backgrounds, professionally and educationally, so that they can provide different ideas and perspectives on the problems that you're trying to solve. This is what my personal UX process looks like, and this is the process that I brought to HubSpot. It's a circle, so it actually happens in cycles. It's iterative. And there are three phases to it, think, make, and check. And I will tell you all about all three of those phases here in a little bit. This may be familiar to some of you all, because this is actually a process called Lean UX. Uh, there was a book written about it by Jeff Gotthelf. Uh, you can pick that up, actually, in Portuguese, um, and read all about uh, sort of some of the stuff that I'm going to go into here today. If we look at this process, on a timeline uh, in comparison to other design processes, we can see how it's different. So in Waterfall, we would create a design for a long time, usually months, maybe even years at a time. And then we finally get it to a point where we're ready to release it, and we put it out there and just let it go. In Agile, we will build for a short period of time and then have an internal release build for another short period of time, have an internal release, until we finally get a stable version of the design. And then we will release it to the public and get feedback. In Lean, we build for a short period of time and immediately release it to the public, even if it's not perfect. And then we get feedback from the public, 
and we use that information for the next iteration of our design. We do this over and over and over again. We're always pushing code. We're always pushing designs. We're always making things go live, because that's the greatest opportunity for us to get feedback from the people that are going to be using our product. But it's also the greatest way for us to push ourselves to actually do something and get something out there. So we can see on this timeline how these lean UX cycles move across it. Think, make, check. Think, make, check. Think, make, check. Over and over and over again, until we finally have a product that we're pretty comfortable with. These are all of the deliverables that a lean UX process can provide. And there's a lot of stuff up here, but I'll just kind of go over some of、uh, the high-level stuff. Under think, you have three sections: strategy, research, and analysis. In strategy, we're doing really, really early stuff like competitive analysis,、uh, stakeholder interviews. We're even design, defining our KPIs, key performance indicators, so the metrics that we're going to be measuring our design against. In research, we're collecting surveys, we're auditing our content, interviewing users. Maybe even doing some card sorting to figure out how our categories of our design should work. An analysis: We're already to the point where we're creating personas and we're determining who we think the people are, that are going to be using our design are. Who are they in general, and how should we be designing for them? Once we have a pretty good idea for. Who our users are, what kind of product we want to build, what problem we're solving, and the data behind all of that, we can start to move into the make phase, and this begins with very basic design, where we're just sketching out、uh, concepts for what the design could look like, and then we can move into higher fidelities, creating wireframes, mockups, maybe even partially functional prototypes. And then, when we're comfortable with the design direction, we can move into the implementation phase and start to actually write code and QA test it、uh, to make sure that it works across different devices in different locales, and then push it live. And then, after this, in my opinion, the most important part happens, and it's also the part that we usually forget to do、uh, unless we have a process like this, and that is the check phase. Once we launch. Our design. We go back and we check to see how it performed, learn from its performance, and then use that information for our next iteration to make it better. We're constantly going through this iterative process. So, some example deliverables、uh, in the think phase: we could create scenarios. In the make phase, we could create wireframes, and in the check phase, we could have heat maps,、uh, like you can see here, where they actually show how people click. And essentially, what this empowers us to do is create thoughtful solutions and well-informed designs for the problems that we have. So now that we know what UX is, why should we care about it in the first place? This is a big, pretty big process, right? Why should we try to implement user experience design into our organizations? So that's what I want to discuss, and I want to do that through data. I want to tell you a little bit about some of the data behind user experience, how it's growing, how it's changing, and why it matters. The first thing that we know is that users actually care about design. Designers are not the only people that care about design. In fact, 94% of a user's first impressions of a brand will result from the design of its website. So they land on your website, they see the quality of the design, and then they immediately perceive how good of a brand they think you have. This is not something that we can control. It happens subconsciously, and it's in human nature. Users are also impatient. We live in an era, era where we get information very quickly, and we expect results very quickly. Seventy-nine percent of users will go to a different site if they don't immediately find what they're looking for. And the average user is going to leave your website and not come back if it does not load within three seconds. So your site needs to be fast. It needs to be relevant, and it needs to quickly deliver the information that people are looking for, and respect them as they're in your design. Amazon actually calculated that a one-second delay in their page load time 
will cost them $1.6 billion over the course of a year. So when you deal with business at this scale, you can really start to see how these very, very small improvements to performance or to design can impact a business. Fifty million mobile apps are downloaded every day, and 95% of them are abandoned within a month. I actually wrote、uh, an essay about this called "The Data Behind Why Apps Fail," and it's a fascinating problem because it's very difficult to get people to download a native app on their phone, but then when they open it and they don't immediately see value, they're so quick to delete it. And we see that about 200 apps are actually dominating the entire marketplace right now, which I'll talk about that a little later. In fact. Uh, 25% of apps are abandoned after a single day. So this happens really quick. Somebody downloads your app, they open it, they see they don't like it, they're like, "I don't want this anymore," and they delete it. Users also value good experiences. They want us to respect their time while they're on the web, and this is why we see that over 220 million desktop users and 420 million mobile users run an ad blocker. We've started to create very intrusive and unfriendly ads that will ruin experiences for people on the web. And there's technology that prevents them from having to deal with any of this. So if they don't want our annoying ads, they don't have to see them. We're even starting to see browsers. Come into play that will automatically block ads. I think that this is where the strength of user experience design and inbound marketing really starts to show itself. Because our idea is that we don't create ads, we don't disrupt people. Rather, we want to create content and experiences that people are naturally attracted to, and they come to us on their own because we're providing them with true value. You are actually 64 times more likely to climb Mount Everest than you are to click a banner ad. The stuff isn't effective anymore. It may have been effective at one time, but we are numb to these now outdated and intrusive forms of advertising. But there's a lot of innovation that's happening in the ad space. This is a really cool ad、uh, that was done by Spotify on the Snapchat platform. And、this ad was in a Snapchat story. It was a 10-second ad that was re-、uh, received over 26 million views, and this caused a 30% lift in Spotify's subscription intent. So, what they learned here was that if they can deliver an ad that is relevant to the experience that somebody is already in, you know, like you're watching a Snapchat story about a music concert, and then Spotify, a music company. Delivers an ad also about a concert and their platform, that people will be more likely to appreciate it and engage with it. This is an even better example, where Taco Bell created a lens that received 244 million views on Snapchat in a single day, and this is crazy because the average user will play with a lens for 22 seconds, and this is where we can see. How this relationship between the user and the business, where they're both providing each other value, is the best way to approach things. Taco Bell created this fun little toy that people could play with on Snapchat, and so in return, people played with it and they engaged with their brand. We're also seeing big companies confirm that user experience is important to them. Google is now punishing sites that are not mobile optimized. So if your site is not optimized for mobile, they're actually going to push it down in search results. They are、uh, also punishing sites that have mobile interstitial pop-ups. So if you're on mobile and you open a site and it、uh, has an interstitial dialogue, then they're going to punish your site. And then、uh, they are boosting sites that have SSL encryption. So if your website is encrypted, it's secure. They're going to be more likely to put you higher in the rankings. So,、uh, with software like HubSpot, we make sure that our sites are always mobile optimized, that they're always encrypted, and that we don't do weird things like、uh, bring in mobile interstitials. And finally, we've learned that UX can actually be a pretty good investment, both within a company and outside of a company. 
If you were to take a $10,000 investment and place it only in design-centric companies, companies that are led by design, over the course of 10 years, your investment would have yielded a 228% per, greater return than the same investment in the S&P. So you can take a $10,000 investment and put it in design-centric companies, and another $10,000 investment and put it in just regular any company, and the investment in the design-centric companies will perform at 228% better. That's pretty powerful stuff. But should this surprise us? Think about some of the companies that you associate with being design-driven, companies that really care about design. Certain brands always come to mind. Apple, Spotify, Slack. All of these companies are doing pretty good, and they are all decidedly design-driven. We're even seeing entire venture capital funds come into the marketplace that will only invest in design-centric companies. Designer Fund is a big fund in the United States that only invests in companies that were founded by designers, because they believe that having a design-focused approach to business is the best way to go. This is all happening because UX is growing at a global scale. We've seen its growth in tandem with inbound marketing over the course of the past few years. Whereas inbound marketing has grown, UX has also grown. They kind of share similar philosophies. This map in the background is a map of a small community of designers that I belong to called Designer Hangout. You can find it at designerhangout.co. It's just a Slack community of about 6,500 people. And we started to map ourselves around the world. And what we found is that even in our small community, every corner of the world is represented. So there are UX designers everywhere. Everybody is picking this stuff up. If you want to join that community or learn more about any of the statistics that I just shared with you, you can go to this link at uxd.to slash guide. I'll let you all take pictures real quick. We're also observing that user behavior is changing on a fundamental level. So while we are changing the ways that we approach design, users are also changing the ways that they use our designs. By show of hands, how many of you all have read Mary Meeker's Internet Trends Report for 2016? Almost nobody. That is terrible. <laughs> I'm glad you've read it. <laughs> um, so this is an amazing report that comes out every year uh, by KPCB, which is an investment research firm in the United States, and they pull some of the best data I've ever seen. And I always have very high expectations for this report, and it's always better than I expected it to be. Now, it's a gigantic report, so I can't really tell you everything that's in it, but it's free, and you can find it online. And real quick, I'm just going to go through some of the highlights from this report that are most relevant to this discussion that we're having about design. So the first thing that stood out to me from Mary Meeker's report was that she is finding that the time that people spend on certain platforms is actually disproportionate compared to the amount of money that we spend advertising on those platforms. People are spending very little time in print, and we're putting a lot of money into print still. Radio is about equal. TV is going down, despite the fact that it's still the largest. Internet is about equal. But the biggest opportunity that she was seeing was that on mobile, we're having people spend a ton of time, but we're using very little money in mobile advertising. In fact, she found a $22 billion opportunity in the United States alone. E-commerce is growing at an exponential rate. Less than 2% of of businesses were selling products online in 2000, and now over 10% of retail sales are happening online. So everything that's happening at this conference, it's growing at an exponential rate. We're also seeing that the social networks that we engage with are changing. So uh, on the going from left to right here, we can see um, the, per, the penetration of each social network, and then the higher that they are, 
the more time users are spending on that network. So Facebook is ridiculous because they have almost 100% penetration in the United States, and by, by far they take up all of our time, over 1,000 minutes per month. But there are also some other really interesting outliers, like Instagram having over 60% penetration and still taking up a pretty good amount of time, LinkedIn having over 50% penetration, but really taking up very little time out of our month. And then Snapchat still having low penetration, but growing at a very fast rate and taking up a lot of time, over 350 minutes per month. The trend that we can see here is that actually image platforms as a whole are growing. This is the growth of image platforms over the course of the last 10 years. And in the 2015 graph, we can see that yellow represents Snapchat, and everything else represents platforms owned by Facebook. So Facebook and Snapchat are both making pretty big bets that they think that image-based platforms are the way of the future. We also know that people who use image-based platforms have very high buyer intent. So actually, the second most common reason why people use Pinterest is they report that they're actually going there to purchase products. So despite the fact that this is a social network for sharing images, people actually go there to shop. We're seeing that the devices that we use are also changing along with the mediums that we use. So for the first time in the last 10 or so years, smartphone sales have declined. We always saw that it was going up and to the right, but this year the growth was slowed by a slight margin. And then weirdly, on the other end of things, we're seeing uh, new products like the voice-based Amazon Echo growing. And finally, people are getting a little bit worried about their privacy and their data security. This is a big one. We all know about everything that happened with Edward Snowden and WikiLeaks and weird government spying, tech companies doing weird things. People are aware of this. In fact, 45% of people reported being more concerned about their privacy than they were a year ago, and 74% reported that they have limited their online activity in the last year just because of privacy concerns. So they're actually using the web in a different way because they're afraid about the, the data that we're collecting on them. I did an entire uh, episode of a podcast that I host called the UX and Growth Podcast specifically about this. And we're pretty sure that the future frontier for competition is not going to be in features, is not going to be in pricing, maybe not even in design anymore, but is actually going to be in privacy and data security. Who are the companies that we can trust the most? How do you build user trust? So again, if you want to read this entire report, it's over 200 slides long. This short link will, will take you to KPCB's website. You can watch a video of Mary giving the report. She's really excellent. This is some world-class data. What this empowers us to do is understand our audience on a deeper level and make decisions that are centered around them. But how is this actually done? So we know what UX is, we know the data behind it. How do we actually do this stuff? I want to share an example of a HubSpot case study with you all. This is what our homepage used to look like about a year ago. And then we uh, went through several different iterations, and we landed on a design that looks like this. So a drastic departure over time. We started this by going through an analytics review. We looked at our historical data. How was the site performing? What can it tell us from a quantitative perspective? And this is all in the think phase. We then looked at our heat maps and our scroll maps to see what people were clicking on, uh, where they were spending the most time on a page. We looked at session recordings, so how people were using the site anonymously as they were on it. And then we used this information to run user tests and ask specific questions to people as they were using the website. We interviewed our stakeholders and our customers to understand their goals for the design. 
And we even got some unsolicited feedback. HubSpot is a pretty big brand, so we have a lot of people coming to our website, and they like to tell us what they think of our designs. They like to tell us that they either love our designs, they hate our designs, whatever it is, they love to give us feedback. This particular guy wrote 2,200 words about how much he hated our design, and it was awesome. Uh, so we use this feedback to drive some of our decisions and factor it in with the other research that we were doing. And then once we had a pretty solid direction, we moved into wireframes, where we could uh, start to create basic versions of the design, just establishing the hierarchy, and, and still have a, a flexible canvas to work with. Then we moved into a higher fidelity, creating mock-ups, adding the photos, adding the colors, the typography. Then we uh, started to map out interactions, because th these designs aren't static. They don't stay the same. So when a mouse moves over the design, how does it change? What are the different things that happen? We started to create those interactions. And then we use smart content. So HubSpot, uh, something that is proprietary to our platform is that we have something called smart content, which will allow us to detect who a user is and then deliver them a custom experience based off of who they are that we think is tailored to get them to convert at the highest rate. So everybody in this room could go, go to the website, and we're going to be detecting who they are and delivering slightly different content and designs based off of who you are as an individual. We tested it for accessibility. So people who have color blindness may have a hard time using certain designs. We want to make sure that they can interpret and use our designs. We internationalized it for multiple different languages. And of course, this is a little difficult, because uh, in what you, whatever you write in English can take up over 100% more space in Japanese, and we had to internationalize for Japanese. So that was something that we had to think about from the start. And then finally, we got to the point where we were ready to develop the code and create a functional design. We quality assurance tested it across multiple different devices, multiple different locations. And then we finally got to the point where we pushed it live. And we did this at Inbound, our annual event, uh, with a around 20,000 people that attend. And we talk about inbound marketing. We have thought leaders from all over the world. And we pushed a new version of the website during that. That was a pretty cool moment. But this wasn't the end of it. We didn't launch the site and then forget about it. We still went back through that check phase where we wanted to see how it was performing and what we could do better. And we iterated on it. And now we have another version of the site that is live. This, is, this version we landed on after about 15 uh, additional tests. And now, today, we're, we're still running uh, more tests to figure out what works the best. So the idea is that it's still a constantly changing design. We saw uh, from, from this testing and the iteration that we did that our conversion rate went up, our exit rate went down, so people were less likely to leave the site, and also pain point exhibiting behaviors went down. So people were less likely to do weird things, like go directly to our frequently asked questions from our home page. They were less likely to search for products. Instead, they would just go directly to them. So we knew that the design was performing at a better rate. So now that we know what UX is, some of the statistics behind it, and what a project looks like, what are the ideal tools that we can use to bring user experience design back to our organizations today? So I want to talk about the tools worth using, the ones that I think you should actually pay attention to. Uh, and these are tools that I use every day. This is all of them, just about. Uh, in the Think section, usertesting.com is really good for remote, unmoderated usability testing. You can get some really quick user tests out of that. Hotjar is a free tool that uh, will heat map your site, do screen recordings. You can ask survey questions to people as they come on your site. So a lot of really good uh, mix between qualitative and quantitative feedback. It's a wonderful product. Crazy Egg is a more enterprise, higher level, scientific heat mapping and scroll mapping software. And we, we actually have the guy who started Crazy Egg here at this conference, Neil Patel. It's an awesome product. We love using it at HubSpot. 
Usabilla is an all-around usability suite uh, that you can install on your site. Usability Hub will allow you to take a design that isn't finished and test it before you code anything. You can test it with, with an actual audience. And Optimal Workshop is ideal for card sorting, uh, creating trees for, for navigation, basically figuring out how you are going to organize the information in your design. When you get to the phase where you want to create a design, Gliffy is a really good uh, graphing tool that you can use to create user flows, map out your, your site map. Xmind is a mind mapping tool for brainstorming sessions. Balsamic and Axure are wireframing tools. So those wireframes that you saw, you can create those low fidelity designs with tools like Balsamic and Axure. Sketch and Photoshop are the most common tools for higher fidelity mockups. And there are a ton of prototyping tools, but InVision, Adobe XD, Marvel, Webflow, UXPin, and even Keynote, which comes on any MacBook that you buy, can be used for creating prototypes. And then when you get to the point where you're ready to check the design and see how things performed, Google Analytics is completely free. Mixpanel is a good uh, custom implementation if you want to have stuff that goes between uh, software and your site. Kissmetrics is a really good funnel creation tool. And Optimizely is a nice A-B testing tool. If you get to a point where you want to do all of this in a single spot, you can use a tool like HubSpot. We've actually built our, our platform around this entire ethos. And uh, there's a lot of different tools that you can use within that platform to uh, to go through this entire process. So we've built each tool for uh, a specific use case. For inbound marketing, we have the HubSpot marketing tool. For inbound sales, we have the HubSpot sales tool. Both of, um, all of the tools that you see here actually are free. The only thing is that the HubSpot marketing tool is free for 30 days. But the rest of them are completely free. Um, so HubSpot sales for inbound sales. Customer data, if you want to like store your customer data and integrate that across multiple uh, different platforms, we have the HubSpot CRM, which is completely free. There's no payment to go with it, and you can, it will be free forever. Uh, Growth-driven design is a program that we're experimenting with to try to take marketing and sales and bring it together in design. And then Lead-in is one of my favorite tools. Uh, it started as a WordPress plugin, and now you can use it anywhere. It's completely free, and it's only focused on conversion. So how can you improve the conversion of your website? We use these tools, again, to sort of go back to this process of focusing on that conversion path. And we believe that if you're using the right tools, if you're using the right philosophy, that you're going to be best equipped to convert, focusing on design, sales, and marketing. And if we can properly bring together these three areas, I really think that we're going to have a great shot at not only creating better solutions for our users, but also creating better solutions and more effective designs for our businesses. HubSpot's information is on the left. Any of those tools that I mentioned, you can go to that URL and check it out. Uh, my information is on the right. If you want to learn more about the design work that I'm doing here in Brazil and South America, you can go there. And also, at uxd.to slash guide, again, you can find all of the tools that I mentioned and, and all of the sources. Thank you all for having me here today.